Hello and welcome to One on One on Plus TV Africa. My guest today is Paul Orajaka. Paul Orajaka is the founder of All Done Toys, an African-themed toy company valued at over $10 million. Thank you for joining me in the studio. Thank you for having me. How did this all come about? Was it that you had a lot of toys surrounding you while you were growing up or what exactly happened? Well, funny enough, my dad is an artist. I grew up in an art family, okay. and my dad was always engaging us in his workshop to do craft work. So, and growing up, my dad didn't want to spoil us, so he didn't give us toys, not because of affordability, but because of his word principle of us working hard and affording things for ourselves. So basically, I didn't grow up with toys, and then when I got the chance to get into toys, I got fascinated. Mm. So there was no Batman, Spider-Man? Absolutely nothing. All you had <laughs> in my dad's craft shop was having the hunter man, the elephant, mm. the fruits and stuff like that. We were actually making money from a very young age because my dad introduced us to those kind of entrepreneurial journey where we had to produce things over the weekends. Okay. And then during the long holidays, we were in his workshops and then we had like a small shelf in his showroom where these things were being sold. And at the end of the school year, when we come back for holidays, there's an account where my dad take some percentage, my mom takes some, and then we, the young guys, me and my brother, we take our own percentage. Mm -hmm. And at a very young age, we had our accounts, whereby we could actually deposit, but we couldn't withdraw without my dad countersigning because we're actually underage. So this was actually what I grew up knowing, all about craft, arts, and that kind of family I come from, known as Oragis Craft Limited. All right, so did you already have an idea of the fact that we're going to start making toys, African toys at the time or it just happened over time or absolutely along the way. it's more like an accident because remember coming to lagos was more like to travel overseas mm -hmm. i was supposed to go to fort valley state college i came to the embassy with a couple of my friends everybody got admitted with the visa and then but only me was refused the visa so staying back in lagos no wanted to go back to worry because i grew up in worry people call me waffy boy so the whole <laughs> idea is that i didn't want to go back i had to pitch and stay with my in-law, who was actually in Idumota, importing. And that was actually the first time I got into Idumota and seeing the kind of level of trade and a lot of my Igbo brothers making a lot of money. It was like, wow, if I stay here long enough, work hard enough, I'll probably be like this boy. So that was more like an inspiration that actually enabled me settle. And in the course of being in Idumota, I love to hustle. So that restless spirit made me connect to venture into other things and that was how i started getting some things from friends who were in london and taking them to supermarkets around vi like park and shop and the rest and that was how in every of these business visit there's a lot of time to process your lpos so i always go to the toy shelf to like just feed my eyes and wow like look at this toy it does like this this skates this like this so i i fell in love with this shelf so i was always using this shelf to pass time Mm. And at the, at the time, the shirt that used to be so robust started going very scanty. Apparently, for some reason, maybe the importer or maybe the supplier was no longer bringing in stock. So I just okay. went to the Deepak, the manager, and I said, Deepak, hey, guy, I can actually give you some toys. And I made this commitment, not even knowing where toys were being sold in the Dumata. But you see, as an entrepreneur, you have to understand those... those There's a certain mindset to carry along with those you. Those opportunities, conception, when you send an opportunity, you quickly grab it. So like... He just registered that this was an avenue to expand what I was actually doing with them currently. And when I go back to my in-laws office, I start asking my colleagues, come on, where in Idumata did they sell toys? And that was how this whole journey about toy became from something you, like in Nigerian parlance, play play, became something big. So at that point, the whole thought of having wanting to travel to America right after high school had gone. At this point, do you have any regrets not traveling when your mates were traveling? Well, because... You know how it feels when, like he said, this sounds like Alibaba's story, where he yeah. said that he, he himself, and I think there was one story about 24 people going in for a job, 23 were picked, only him was not picked. Yep. You and your friends went for visa, visa and interview. then they all got, you didn't get. So at, was there a point where you said to yourself, I think I'm better off not being given the visa at the time? Well, um, it all depends because if you see, as a young boy, I didn't know what tomorrow had for me. You know, sometimes they say you plan the future, but the future does not necessarily follow the plan. So I had a plan of actually being in the US. But for some reason, maybe God felt there was a better opportunity for me to start off something in an environment I was not used to. So the whole idea was that absolutely there was no regret because 
going into the motor and being inspired by the young guys and the level of trade I was seeing at a young age. I was remember I was barely 17. So like, come on, these guys, I have to walk. And surprisingly, my brother-in-law was such a very wonderful fellow who actually allowed me to get commission for all the hustles I was doing with this business. And at the time, I had so much money as a young boy and I completely lost interest in education. It might interest you to know that I actually went to university where my mates were graduating. So the whole idea was that at least I had four years in the Dumata, four or five years in the Dumata, trading, learning the street. And that's why I always tell people my first degree was actually UI. Mm -hmm. And people would tell me, oh, you rest off your bad. And I said, no, come on, this is the rest of your Dumata. <laughs> so, so that's the whole idea about how the dream all started. So, and then you could see, starting off with Dumata, I completely lost interest in even going to school because it was like that evil mindset of making money and just being rich. But I had an uncle, Yuri Achukudum, who was such a wonderful fellow, and he said, come on, Paul, I see you doing well, but you had a fantastic wire. Why would you be in the Dumata trading? There are things you should decide choose between two things. Do you want to be a wealthy man or do you want to be a quality man? Mm, Any mm. fool can make money and be wealthy, but not every fool can lead a quality life. So you need to go back to school. These like experiences, that. these skills, this knowledge you learn from school, they help you grow those business opportunities and open up greater windows for you. And because he was such an uncle I revered and respected so much, I took his advice. And that was how the story of Unilag came about, where I graduated with in, in accounting, and okay. then went okay. on to do my master's in management in Unilag, went on to Lagos Business School to do my MBA, and the whole list continued until we landed in Harvard to do our master's in public admin. <laughs> so you could see a young boy who came into Lagos to go to a school, like a, a third year university in America, mm -hmm. Fort Valley State College, only ended up going to one of the best schools in the world. So this is some of the stories that we look at and I said, well, God probably prepared us for something, and that's why it didn't work out at that point in time. Sometimes we just need to relax, don't you think? Absolutely, and let the will of God take control. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then in terms of you having garnered all of these experiences from a place like Idumota, it's not the most structured, if I would put it in that light. Yeah. So how are, you, how are you able to structure, put in a, a good level of structure in your business when you started? Well, good enough. When you come to Idumota, you see the level of chaos around the place. But like you see, we actually learned the rope. We started from very small. Remember, I would just come and buy toys and take to supply. Yes. And then at the point, I needed to start selling even in the local market because those I was buying from at the time I started going to Dubai. I was barely 19, making my first trip. And then coming to Dubai, coming to Idumata with my wares, after supplying, I would go back to those guys who were selling to me and start selling some of my leftover stock after I must have supplied the big stores in Via, Nikoi, and Apapa and the rest back then. So but the point is this, I decided to get into the market myself because those whom I was supplying in the local market were not giving me the level of reciprocity that I was actually getting from them okay. when I was dealing with them. So what I did was I went on, got a very small counter so when you come to Dumata, the spaces are very short and you have to pay a lot of money. So from the small counter, we kept focus. I didn't have the money to pay for staff. So I had to bring my sisters or my brothers, whoever, whoever was available, was helping me. And then from the counter, we got into a half shop. And this kind of half shop we're talking about is something that is so, so, so small that when you range, you have to be on top of your decks because everywhere is wow. flooded right into the store, into the shop. Wow. So, but... With the dream, I saw that over time we come to scale. Then we got a full shop, and today we're sitting in the four, fourth floor plaza where people come. You buy things. It's as if you're in a mall, and it's all wholesale. So, so for me, we started off in we started off in Dumata in a very small level, and we built the structure over time. And mind you. At the time, we were also trying to scale up. The banks didn't believe in us. These are some of the challenges entrepreneurs face in the country. And these are some of the reasons why I'm actually a doctoral student at Henley Business School. Okay. And my focus is on entrepreneurial orientation of SMEs and how the environmental factors affect their performance. Because you see, SMEs run every nation. But in Nigeria, they seem to Apparently, be... Apparently, yes. They seem to be... A, to have been neglected. When you come into our store today, you see the quality of employees we have. You see the quality of people working there, and you understand that we're doing something great. Why do you think that banks do not 
would I say believe in SMEs when they approach them at the first instance? Because in most cases, you realize that those SMEs that the banks probably were not willing to give loans to because of the high interest rates, yeah. right? Um, they end up doing very well. Absolutely. We are a living example of that. And I will tell you something, after we've hustled and built this structure, we became the beautiful bride. And every bank wanted to bank us. But at the time, we were trying to give them and convey the dream to them and tell them, listen, listen, we have this. And then they come and they look at our business and they say the guy is sitting in a very small shop and they say, oh, you're not structured. And funny enough, the, the company they say was not structured is actually being um, um, reorganized by KPMG. They are our strategic wow. growth partners. Mm. You understand? But you need to give the child the time to mature into what you want them to be. You don't expect the child to actually run at a very young age. So what, what the, the problem these banks are uh, missing is that they see the dog, but they don't see the side of the fight in the dog. You know, so there's a whole lot in us that, that there is this entrepreneurial spirit that makes us want to forge ahead despite all odds. And but they couldn't see this thing. But in as much as that was the case, we never relented. We continued to forge ahead. And funny enough, today they are all coming. Rather than before we're seeking for them to give us money, right now we will become money placers with these banks. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the things you see that but it shouldn't be the case because many entrepreneurs like me would have actually fallen by the wayside. And and the irony is that when you see the level of funds that are going bad debts with these banks for these so-called big ticket businesses, companies. you can imagine and if you just take one one tenth of that money for SMEs, mm -hmm. they could actually scale up their businesses. Mm -hmm. So it's just the irony of the kind of environment we're working in. And that's why some of our, my doctoral thesis is, is actually meant to address some of these challenges so that we can profile practical and theoretical solutions to the challenges SMEs face in such a complex country. Right, we'll hold on with that thought right now. All right, we'll hold on for a quick break. You're still watching One on One on Plus TV Africa. Thank you for staying with us. I'm still speaking with Paul Orajaka. Thank you. Thank you. All right, then. Before we left off, we were talking about the challenges SMEs face in terms of acquiring loans from banks. Let me find out, how did you start, how did you get your startup capital? Well, funny enough, um, when you read some of our articles, they say we started with, with $100. That $100 was actually part of the, the 5000 capital we set off to do our first business in park and shop. Funny enough, when I was working with my in-law, like I told you, I was actually getting stipends, monthly allowance, and I was also getting commission. So based on those savings, so I started supplying those things that my friends were bringing in from London. So at that point, we built this money, and our very first capital was actually that 5,000, and the invoice is still standing in our office as part the of symbol. the symbol of the foundation for this capital we're actually working on now. So we actually grew organically, growing this. Even, you know one interesting thing, the first time I had the first order in Park and Shop where I made 18,000, when I got the check, it was a total of about 36,000. I came up, looked at the heaven, read the check, 36,000, I danced. And that's why one of our very big team today is like, the heaven saw the dance. It's like, we danced out of joy, but over time, that same joy of a of the six thousand, we're leaving those places with checks of about a million, two million, ten million, just for them in your pocket, and then you just slide into your office. You know, so the whole idea is we appreciated something, and for some mm -hmm. reason, mm -hmm. there was a way the heavens saw the joy and he multiplied the efforts. So this was actually how we built our capital from scratch. scratch and, and when we hit about half a million, we felt we didn't need to buy from the local market. And that was why we traveled to Dubai. And I, I set a goal for myself as a young boy, and I said to myself, my friends are in school studying. I'm not in school. But then I read something about Socrates Onassis. He said, by the time you're 21, you've not made a million. Forget it, you're not as good as making the grade. So for me, I use that as a benchmark, and I said, by the time I'm 21, I want to be a millionaire. And I tell you, just the way we set out our hearts to achieve this, at 21, we're already having so much, and we beat the mark, and we beat it pretty well. So that was how the whole thing continued to transcend into 
bigger multiple, capital. Multiple, multiple millions. Absolutely. Fantastic. Let's delve into the toys themselves. I see the lady dolls wearing very fantastic uh, African apparel. Where are mm. they sourced? Where are your materials sourced? Well, <clears throat> the key thing would be, first, we wanted to promote our culture. And then, because as a business, we were selling the white skin dolls, you know, the likes of the Barbies and them. Um, at the time, we asked ourselves. I had, I had Barbie dolls when I was growing up. Absolutely. But then I you see, but the whole idea, when you see the new generation of Nigerian child, now they say, my Aisha, my Amaka, my Runke, my Malaika. <laughs> when you hear this kind of story, it's not my Barbie, you know, and all those names they give to them. So we wanted to actually bring this kind of value to the Nigerian child to own dolls that look and represent who they really that are. look like us. Absolutely. Not those dolls that actually have unrealistic figures manufactured somewhere from one mode in China. So that was how the whole concept of the doll came about. And then when we started this whole concept, we brought the whole thing all fully packaged from China. Okay. Because we wanted to introduce this thing for the first time. And when we got the response from the Nigerian from Nigerians, we were absolutely amazed. And the whole idea was to gradually get this into the full local production. So right now I'm glad to say that our doors, the clothes are being made by friends of the disabled. These are girls on wheelchair mm -hmm. who have skills for tailoring. We give them a lot of this material. We sign them more use with them. These girls are making income while making the clothes for the doors. They also make the beats and stuff like that. Right now, as I can tell you, the, the doors, only the doors come from China naked no other thing comes in all the printing all the but clothes. can't that be done here in nigeria what well, are the restrictions well, it's, it's actually a gradual process because the whole idea is that we just can't get it all at once remember we brought this in all actually. fully boxed right now they come in knockdown parts flat packs so everything is being assembled locally so and at the time we just had an mou with policy toys in Belarus. The whole idea is to start bringing in machineries to actually get these doors manufactured Here in locally. Absolutely. Okay. It's amazing where you're an Igbo child and then you have Aisha. Remember when you look at these doors, they have booklets in them whereby there are distinctives about every particular tribe that are in these booklets. So the child start getting a feel of what other tribes look like. You understand yes. from there and we also have some very simple local language imprinted on the booklet so that actually they could actually pick some few local dialects and you know the way the nigerian child Fantastic. and that's why i begin to lose their mother tongue because everybody's is trying to be more want to be more western absolutely than everything else. so these are the things we want to do so we are so intrigued about the kind of value we're bringing for us it is principle chase the value and then the money will come after you of but course. when you chase the money the value disappears mm -hmm. and then everything goes bonkers so this is some of the reasons why we are so happy with what we're doing with the dolls the kind of employment we are creating the local women making these dolls these are women who like like the the lead person the lead local woman this is a lady who came crying that her husband had left her with another woman with four kids and then she's been having one issues or the other. And I said, come on, you're a tailor, come. We'll sign you up into the program for Unity Doll Empowerment Program. And then start making this thing. And you know the funny thing, when she initially started, her friends were like laughing at her, come on, how come you are sewing clothes for baby? You know, <laughs> so that was the kind of language and response she was getting. But at the end of it all, all her friends had joined her because as I speak to you, the woman has probably made over $30,000 worth of clothes for the dolls. Whatever is going to South Africa, going all over Africa, she also has her own materials in them. The Friends of the Disabled are doing it. And also, the graduate apprentice students of the Lagos State and Two College students are actually making this close. We signed up 40,000 units of the doors with them, with the executive secretary. And these are there are no jobs in Nigeria. So these girls signed up for the um, graduate apprentice program of this technical college to learn skills. Yeah. And when you learn these skills and you don't have the kind of jobs or the kind of commitment to enable you practicalize Practice, these things. Yes. So that is where our impact is beginning to get a lot of values. And we have this business model whereby we say we want to harness people who want to make good with their purchase. That's why every unit of our door, some price of our doors is set aside, some amount is set aside for social work. Fantastic. If you Fantastic. look at some of the schools we've renovated, like um, Salvation Army Primary and Nursery School, Igobo, Ikorodu, 
these are run down schools. You wonder how kids are learning in social environment. I like how everything just narrows down to the society. It feels like there's the mindset of how to help society in terms of unity and diversity, helping create jobs. How is the government helping with your initiative? Well, absolutely, we've never even looked at the government. We're not, we're not even bothered because it's Has the government say, approached you at all? Not really. I would say Lagos State Government only recognized our impact. So they, they gave us an award for support our school initiative, you know, um, and at least they were happy what we've been doing with the Lagos State, um, in Lagos State in terms of the technical college students, the schools we renovated in, in Ikorodu, okay. you know, and some of the impact we're making. So, yes, fine, they recognize the achievements and the impact we're making, but in but terms of support, but in terms of support, we're not even looking at that because actually government can do it all. So it's every individual. If people continue to do one or two things like this, we'll have a better society. Mm -hmm. We can't leave it all to the government. It's it's very complex. Exactly. So that's why we're not bothered. Just to let you know, in the Dumata, we're more like our own local government because we have to provide our own lights, our own roads, our own, literally everything, everything we do on our own. Everything. So you will wait for the government, literally you won't be able to function. So, so how frequently do you still visit Idumata? Certainly I just came from Idumata. <laughs> of course, I, I stay in Idumata every day. Mm. That's the head office, that's where it's happening. And then for us, you remember, it's the commercial nerve center. The left of trade going in Idumata is, it's only those who don't know would underestimate that value and the level of trade that's happening in Idumata. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That's all we can have at this point. But thank you for joining me in the studio. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. And well done on your job. Thank you so much. All right, then. And that's all we can have at this hour on Plus TV Africa on One on One. Do stay with us. And for more informative content of this nature, do follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn, all on Plus TV Africa. I remain your host, Irene Ubani. Bye. <laughs>